Okay, why don't we uh, go ahead and get started again. Um, so as, as many of you know, this is being filmed for posterity. And I'm told that uh, these lectures are already up on uh, YouTube. In fact, this lecture that I'm about to give is already up on YouTube. <laughs> so, um, so this is a multimodal integration part two. And this is just going to be a continuation from where I left off on the slides from earlier this morning. Um, so if you remember, this is, this is a slide that I left off with that you don't actually have in your, in your books, um, but it will be up on, on YouTube. Uh, so just to, to summarize a little bit here, um, you, have, um, you, you have your DTI, fMRI, at ASL, whatever. Uh, which is going to be, probably be multiple time points. And so you would pick one of those time points and you would motion correct to those time points. And, um, and then you would do your uh, multimodal analysis, FMRI, DTI, ASLF, whatever it is. Uh, and that will generate maps that are in alignment with the template. And then you perform a registration to go between that template and the free server in a tunnel wall. And that can allow you to use um, some of these other commands to, um, to go from uh, the multimodal volume to the pre server volume or the pre server volume back to the multimodal volume. That includes all of the services. <coughs> and so you look at uh, the DTI analysis during the first multimodal integration, and then you just went through the DTI analysis with um, Stasia stuff. Um, and so that's just one example of uh, multimodal integration. Um, another example is fMRI integration. As I, I mentioned this morning, Preserver has a functional analysis stream called FSTAS, and you can do uh, task-based and C um, resting state-based uh, fMRI analysis, and it will do basically all the stuff that I'm telling you, to, to, telling you about. Um, so, but this is also good because um, if you're using, say, FSL or SPL or AFNI or something like that, and you want to integrate uh, Preserver analysis with those analyses, then you would have to be able to do the stuff that I'm describing here. Um, it also helps you to understand uh, pre-surfer better and how multimodal integration works, even if you are using FSF. Um, and um, and if you want to do something outside of uh, of those modalities, I don't know what other modalities, maybe even CT or something like that, um, this gives you. Uh, the foundation that they'll need to be able to go back and forth between all these different modalities and customize your analysis. So this one is uh, fMRI integration. So um, I'll go through, uh, we've already been through the registration part of it, so it's assume that you've probably done motion correction on your fMRI to the middle time point, that's your template, you've already uh, registered everything. And so you want to take the results for the individual and view them on the volume, the anatomical, or view them on the surface. Um, and then the other uh, three things are to do an ROI study similar to um, what you already did with the fractional anisotropy, where you say you pick an ROI and you average a human and average response over that ROI. Uh, in addition, there's a second type of region of interest study that you can do where you say just give me the average of the human and response over an area in an ROI that is functionally activated by a task. And then finally, I'll go through the surface-based uh, group analysis. So I, I don't have time to go through and teach you everything about fMRI analysis. So this is going to be two or three slide uh, crash course on fMRI analysis. So this is a hemodynamic response. This is a canonical one from SPM. Horizontal axis is time since stimulus onset, and the stimulus onset is represented by this green bar. So you get some, some short stimulus, and, uh, and, and then you measure the, the, the full response after that, say, every two seconds. And this is what the hemodynamic response looks like. It's got uh, some delay time to peak, which might be as much as six seconds, because we're talking about sluggish blood flow and not really um, uh, electrical neural responses. Um, then it returns back down to baseline, perhaps undershooting, and then returning back to equilibrium after 16, uh, 30 seconds or so. And the amplitude here is the thing that's, that's important that we're interested in, because that amplitude 
if everything's working properly, that amplitude is going to be related to the amount of neural firing. And probably you're not so interested in what the blood flow is. Probably you're doing the experiment because you want to measure what the neural response is. And so it's really this amplitude that we're interested in. So when you actually go to do an experiment, uh, which would be shown by this timeline here, so the horizontal axis is time, each one of those green bars is a stimulus presentation, and underneath there it's assumed that the, you have this blue line underneath that it is the human anatomic response, and that's the same response every time by, by assumption, but you don't get to observe that. What you observe is this noisy version of the human anatomic response, and the noise is different from one presentation to the next. And so if you took all the presentations and put them together, uh, then you would see that none of them would look exactly the same. But if you average them together, uh, as I've done here on the right side, then you get something that looks uh, fairly uh, reasonable like a human anatomic response. So that's why you collect multiple presentations in an fMRI experiment. Uh, so there are basically three things that you can get out of this. So this would be at, at an individual voxel. So one would be the average of the hemodynamic response amplitude. And the other, since you're, you're collecting multiple time points, multiple presentations, you can get a standard deviation, an error bar on that. And if you take the ratio of those two, then you get a t-test. So you can get an amplitude, a variance of the amplitude, and the ratio, which would be a t-test. But you do that for every single voxel. And so you can create these statistical parametric maps. Uh, this first one is the percent signal change uh, from 0 to 3%. This is a, um, a, a, uh, a multi-sensory presentation, so the person is listening to beeping tones and seeing a flashing checkerboard and also doing finger tapping. So you would expect a functional activation in occipital cortex in the back of the head, which you see here, and auditory cortex, which you see here and here. Uh, and motor cortex, which you cannot see on this particular slice. So you see that some of the, you know, a lot of the brain is positive, some of the brain is negative. Uh, this is the variance map uh, for each one of these voxels, and if you take the ratio of those two, you get a T-map, which you can then threshold some value. Uh, here I have a threshold at uh, P less than, than 0.01. So the, the, those are the three things that you would get out of a first level fMRI analysis. And so we can take these things and we can do different things with them in FreeSurfer. So we can uh, visualize them on the volume, we can visualize them on the surface, we can compute an average uh, hemodynamic response inside of an ROI, or an average hemodynamic response inside of an ROI, uh, but only the functional, functionally active part of that ROI. And finally, we can also map it onto the surface and then map it onto the um, the, the, the uh, group surface, FS average, and do a group analysis of fMRI in exactly the same way that you did a thickness study yesterday. So uh, the pre-processing overview is that you would do a motion correction on your on your fMRI and do the template and use that, uh, put that in the BB register to register from functional to the anatomical. Uh, if you're doing um, FSL or SDM analysis, do not use nonlinear uh, resampling. Uh, you have to use, uh, it's best to just do it in native space. And uh, do not apply 3D spatial smoothing to your data. So if you're using FSL, put a uh, full without maximum equal to zero. Uh, and same thing for SPM. Uh, because you don't want to do 3D volumetric smoothing because you want to do smoothing on the surface and you can't do that until you sample it onto the surface. So the first level analysis is to um, uh, compute the hemodynamic response amplitude, or typically contrast the amplitudes, it would be, it would be the same thing. Uh, in FSL, these are called COBEs, and SPMs are called CONS, and FSFAS, they're called CES. Uh, you get the variance of the amplitude, which would be bar COBE or CES bar, or I think it's, it's CON bar in, in SPM. And then you get activation maps, which would be Z maps, or T maps, or F maps, or in FSFAS, which would be SIG maps. All of them in alignment with the motion correction. And that's just showing, uh, showing that here. So this is the template. This would be the middle time point for the run. And this is the activation now. So you can see uh, back here you have visual activation, you have motor activation, and then you have uh, auditory activation. This area here. Can you see that? 
Um, so, so now it's assumed that you have this activation map and you have uh, a registration, in which case you can load this up into, into Freeview. Uh, this isn't exactly the Freeview command, but you know, basically the idea is the same. You'll run a Freeview command and it's going to load up the anatomic hole and it's going to load up the uh, A part plus A seg and it's going to show um, it's going to show your activation uh, overlaid onto the anatomical in registration. So this is a good way to view your data because if you want to know where a particular uh, blob happens, happens to be located, you can just click on that and then Freeview will tell you this is in superior temporal gyrus or this is in confidence locus or this is in uh, percentual gyrus. Uh, the next thing you might want to do is to sample it onto the surface. And this is where it starts to get a little bit more complicated. Uh, so remember what a surface is. A surface is a list of vertices, their nearest neighbors, and an x, y, z for each vertex. Uh, so when you overlay it, or when you're looking at the surface uh, on the anatomical volume, you know it's going to look something like this, where the green line is the gray-white boundary, and the blue line is the peel surface. And remember that these are individual vertices, so they're individual points that are in, that are in the anatomical volume. When I look at the functional activation and registration with the anatomical volume, and I, I see that the, that the surface cuts, just cuts a, a, a curve through the activation there. And so each point on that curve is going to be a vertex. So all I have to do is assign that vertex a value from uh, whatever the, the, the functional voxel happens to be that that vertex happens to land on. And that will create an overlay. So remember, an overlay is simply a value in every vertex that's used to assign a color. And so uh, in this case, if this is the hemodynamic response amplitude, uh, this is in a primary auditory cortex, then it's going to sample that value at that vertex. There is a question as to which surface you're actually going to sample on, uh, because if you, if you look at this, you can see that if you sample it on the gray-white boundary, you'll get one map. If you sample it on the peel surface, you'll get another map. Um, and so what we usually do is to sample it halfway in between the, the white and peel. For fMRI resolutions where you're talking about something like three millimeters, it tends not to, to make much of a difference, and I'll show you a few maps on, on that later on. Um, so when you, when you look at these maps, then you can see, okay, here is this activation in primary auditory cortex, and then if you look at it on the inflated map, uh, you can see like all this, all this stuff that's in there that you couldn't see um, on, on, the, on the peel surface. So this is what happens as you change the depth of sampling. Uh, so cortex has, you know, nominally six layers to it, and each one of those layers might have a, a different function. You might, you know, if you were to have that kind of resolution, you might be able to see the different function in different layers. And again, at typical fMRI resolutions or DTI resolutions, you're probably talking about two millimeters, three millimeter voxel size, and cortex is on average about three millimeters. So, you know, you're really being optimistic if you think that sample at the different cortical layers. And so these, this is an example from something that was about three millimeters by three millimeters by five millimeters. And so what I've done is I've sampled from the white surface, which is zero here, to the peel surface, which is plus one. So I know how thick that is, so I can tell uh, FreeSurfer to sample at a given distance between the white surface and the peel surface. And so you can look at the maps and you can see that there's not much of a difference between sampling at the white and sampling uh, at the peel. Uh, for this reason, we usually just sample halfway between the two because that's probably going to be the place where you're going to have the least partial volume effect. Um, if you sample at the peel, uh, you might you risk in increasing the noise because you have a lot of draining blood vessels on, on the peel surface, at least for, for fMRI. Um, and so you can have a lot more noise at the peel surface. If you sample at the white surface, uh, you know, there's no activation in white matter, so you might, you might miss the activation there. So if you sample halfway in between, it's kind of a, a compromise.
<clears throat> so if you want to, to view on the surface, you have to take the data and convert it onto the surface. And that's done with MRI ball to surf. So this is something that takes a volume and converts it onto a surface. So I give it the map that I want to, to convert. Uh, in this case, the sig.nii file. I give it the, the register.dat, which was computed with the register. I tell it that I want, want it on the left hemisphere, and I tell it to, to sample it halfway between the white matter and the gray matter. And then the output is going to be the, this lh.sig.ngh file. And this is going to be an overlay. And so you can take it and, uh, and run uh, TK Surfer on it, or um, have it updated these slides for BB register for uh, for preview. Yet, uh, but this would be the TK Surfer command, and there'll be a similar command for preview. And then when you load it up, you'll see you know something like this, where you can see all of the activations, irritable gyrus, the motor activation, the visual activation, and you can see these little lines uh, outlining the different regions of interest that you would have um, on part of the surface. And so, you know, click on a point, it'll tell you, of course, which uh, region of interest you have. You know. the, the yellow, red and yellow, means that it's positive activation, and blue uh, means that it's negative activation. Uh, so if you want to, to take that, then, and do a surface-based group analysis, you will run this MRS preproc command. So if you remember our MRS preproc from yesterday, this was the command that you ran uh, prior to doing a, a, a GLM analysis. So you would give it your list of subjects and the hemisphere and say that you wanted thickness and it would go off and it would take all of those subjects' thicknesses, sample them on the FS average, and then stack them together into one file, which you, you, you could then smooth and then go off and run a GLM thing. Here, MRS preproc is run in a slightly different way, but the still, idea is still basically the same. So I still give it the, the hemisphere that I want, and I would say sample it onto FS average. Uh, but in this case, I give it, instead of saying dash dash thickness, or dash nose thickness, I give it a dash IV, and then I give it two different arguments here. The first argument is the, the functional volume that I want to resample. In this case, this is uh, subject one's hemodynamic response amplitude. And then I can give it subjects one uh, registration file. And so from that, from the registration file, it knows what the name of the subject is. It can take the hemodynamic response volume and sample it onto the surface of the subject and then onto FS average. And then it does that for each one of the subjects and stacks them together. And then after that, it's uh, almost exactly the same uh, as doing the, the thickness-based study where you would smooth it, and you would run MRI GLM fit, and you would correct for multiple comparisons. So now I'll change gears and talk about doing fMRI analysis, um, in, or ROI analysis, using uh, an fMRI, uh, using this fMRI data. Um, and you know maybe this will be of use to you, and maybe it won't be, but at least you'll start to get some use of uh, these various commands. <coughs> Because probably if you're doing a multi modal analysis, you'll probably want to do something like this at some point. So the first thing is to average the hemodynamic response within, um, that should actually be an inactive area, or uh, uh, regardless of whether it's functionally active or not, uh, inside of an anatomical ROI. So in this case, I can see that there is uh, some intense activity going on here in uh, superior temporal gyrus where the um, where primary auditory cortex is. And that corresponds to this light blue, um, this light blue ROI. So I could ask the question, what's the average hemodynamic response inside of superior temporal gyrus, the entire superior temporal gyrus, regardless of whether it's functionally active or not. <coughs> And so the way that I would do that would be to run uh, MRI ball to ball on the uh, hemodynamic response amplitudes to bring it into the anatomical space. And I won't go through in detail the, all of these command lines because it gets to be a little bit tedious and you'll be working with them in your tutorial anyway. 
then you would run MRI sex dots. So this is the same program that you ran during the tutorial on uh, fractional anisotropy. And this is also the same command that generates the asec.stats file. And so you give it the, the segmentation that you want, you give it um, a color table, and you give it the hemodynamic responses uh, resampled into the anatomical space, and then you give it a, a stats file. And this is going to output the average hemodynamic response for uh, every region of interest, including the superior temporal tires. So another question could be, um, what is, so I have, I have this, uh, this area in superior temporal gyrus that, has, uh, that, is, that is functionally active. Uh, but if you look at, at this, so this is the significance map thresholded at, at 0.01. If I compare that to this light blue area where I know superior temporal gyrus is, you see that not all of superior temporal gyrus is activated by this, uh, by this auditory tone. And so you might want to exclude the inactive areas from your estimate of what the human anatomic response is in, in a superior temporal gyrus. So you could say, um, what, what is the average uh, regardless of, of the sign? So if the task activates um, positive or negative, just tell me what the average is over both positive and negative. If, it's only, if you only want to look at the positive, then uh, you can do that, or the negative, you can do that. So how does this work? Um, I take the significance map, and I map it, I use wall to wall to map it into the anatomical space. So now I have three things, uh, three interesting things in the anatomical space. I have the hemodynamic response amplitude, I have my significance map, and I have my A part plus A seg where I have all my ROIs defined. I then uh, run MRI 6 stats again, and I say, give me the average inside of each ROI, but uh, masked by the significance. So only include voxels that are more significant than, say, 101. And so there are going to be some um, ROIs that don't have any significant uh, activation in them. So they're, not, they're, they're going to have an average of zero because there are no voxels in them that were significant. Um, so uh, you can do this with absolute, so it says give me all of the voxels uh, regardless of uh, what their sign is, um, as long as they're more significant than, than 0.01. Or you could just ask for positive numbers, uh, that is that they're that the more significant than 0.01. Uh, and positive or negative numbers that is more significant than point of one and negative. Uh, but be aware that if you specify that you want uh, just positive or just negative, all the numbers are going to come out positive and negative. So you have to be uh, careful to avoid uh, some circularity there. So to summarize, you, you have um, a multimodal uh, acquisition, which is probably multiple time points. You, um, you create a template from one of the time points, so for FMI, that's usually the middle time point, and you perform all your motion corrections uh, to that time point. Uh, for DTI, it's probably your low B uh, volume, uh, and then you'll do motion correction and edit correction uh, to that particular uh, time point. And then you would use a BB register to register that template to the anatomical. And then once you have that, then everything that you generate inside of the native multimodal space, uh, every map that you generate is going to be in registration uh, with the template. And so you can apply the same registration to bring it into the anatomical space or bring anatomical measures into the multimodal space. Um, and you can use that to, to map onto the surface, uh, projecting to the middle layer between the, the maybe white surface and the peel surface and then um, map that to FS average and do your group uh, exploratory spatial analysis on the surface. Or you can map them into uh, regions of interest. So in the uh, tutorial, uh, you've already gone through the registration. And so you've gone through A and B. So A was the registration, B was DTI. And then there's a C and D, which I think are um, uh, doing uh, 
our Y analysis and then the MRIS uh, proof product to do a to do a little functional group analysis with like five subjects. Um, questions at this point? Yeah. Are you totally overwhelmed? The question is, does this work with a longitudinal study? Uh, yeah, there's no reason why you couldn't do the, like, a longitudinal fMRI analysis or a DTI analysis or that. And what would be the choice of the template? Yeah. Uh, the choice of the template, you would still use the same uh, template. So it's, I've, done, I've done some um, experiments looking to see whether it makes a difference, whether, like, you know, you, you could imagine that if you're doing, like, a longitudinal fMRI study, you take a, um, an anatomical and a functional type of one, an anatomical and a functional one type of two, and and then you use, uh, say, Martin's longitudinal stream to generate you know, uh, your base image and then your template image, your template image, and then capture the one type of two. Um, in this case, you would just register it to you would re you would create a template for each time point and do your motion correction to that and then register that template to the base image uh, your longitudinal and polymer analysis. So we have the uh, tutorial for the next 30 minutes and 40 minutes. Right. So for, oh, for the next uh, 45 minutes, you have uh, the tutorial. Of course, you can work on this tutorial or in the, you know, 